Welcome, friends, to this presentation on AIDS, activism, and American Christianity with this stellar group of presenters. Anthony Petro, PhD, Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, Reverend Dr. Steve Peters, and Reverend Canon Ted Karp. I am Mark Bowman, Executive Director of the LGBTQ Religious Archives Network, the host of tonight's program. LGBTQ RAN is a unique venture dedicated to preserving the history of LGBTQ religious movements around the world. LGBTQ RAN is a digital enterprise. We are not a physical repository that stores papers. We advise and support leaders and groups in their efforts to preserve their records in appropriate archives. Secondly, we collect and provide a treasure of historical information on our website about LGBTQ plus persons and groups from a wide array of religious expressions around the world. And finally, we encourage research and scholarship in queer religious history. We are pleased to have the chance tonight to host an intriguing conversation about Christian activism during the HIV AIDS crisis, featuring three leaders who have been at the forefront of AIDS work since the 1980s. What challenges has the AIDS crisis presented now and in the past, especially for leaders of religious communities that welcome queer people and people of color? How have progressive Christian leaders responded to the emerging and ongoing pandemic? And what work is left to be done? The moderator of tonight's conversation is Anthony Petro, PhD, an historian of religion and sexuality at Boston University and author of After the Wrath of God, AIDS, Sexuality and American Religion, published by Oxford University Press. Petra also founded and directs the Boston University Health Humanities Project. Our three presenters are first, Reverend Dr. Yvette Flander, whose call to blend proclamation worship service and advocacy on behalf of those most marginalized in church and in society led to the founding of the City of Refuge, United Church of Christ, in 1991. In 1993, um, excuse me, in 2003, Flunder was consecrated presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a multi-denominational coalition of over 100 primarily African-American Christian leaders and laity. She is a graduate of the Pacific School of Religion and received her Doctor of Ministry from San Francisco Theological Seminary. Our second presenter is the Reverend Dr. Steve Peters, perhaps best known as the gay pastor with AIDS that Tammy Faye Baker interviewed in 1985. Steve was the field director for the Metropolitan Community Church's AIDS ministry from 1987 through 1997. He has been an MCC clergy person since 1979 and has served congregations in Chicago, Hartford, North Hollywood, and Los Angeles. Our third presenter is the Reverend Canon Ted Karpf, a pioneer in both faith community and community-based public health responses to HIV AIDS since 1983. From 2004 to 2011, he was Partnerships Officer for Faith-Based and Civil Society Engagement in the Office of the Director General at the World Health Organization. Karp was an Ep Episcopal missionary in the 10 million member Anglican Church of Southern Africa as provincial canon for HIV AIDS and deputy to the Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu. Ted also served in the US Public Health Service as an HIV AIDS liaison specialist. To those of you watching this webinar, we welcome your comments or questions in the chat box. The presenters will respond to those during the Q&A time toward the end of today's program. And furthermore, if you would like to offer personal greetings or comments to any of the presenters, stay on after the webinar has concluded and you will be invited into the Zoom room with them. 
Finally, please direct any technical concerns to Asati, who is the tech manager for this program. Now, I am pleased to welcome our three presenters and our moderator, Anthony Petro, to begin this conversation on AIDS, activism, and American Christianity. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, and for everybody at the archive for your work in putting this together. It's really an honor to be here today with these panelists and I look forward to our conversation. Um, please bear with me. I am I have COVID, so I've had COVID all week, um, like many of us do and have. Um, so my voice might be a little croakier than usual, um, but I, I, I very much look forward to our conversation. And I really wanted to start at the beginning with the question of how each of you got involved with HIV AIDS work. So what were the things that brought you to HIV activism and ministry work in your own lives? Should we just jump in? Yes, Bishop Flunder, please do. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am so thrilled to be a part of this conversation, which is also a part of uh, about 35 years of my life. So it is a very important conversation to have. And also particularly because it is treated as though this is not continuing to be a pandemic. Uh, our staff that does this work still in East Africa and West Africa just left Uganda a few days ago where we tested a little uh, close to a thousand people. And in that group, uh, well over 25, 26 people tested positive. And positive is one thing. The rest is how they are also impacting uh, the people that are in their families and the folks that were there that caused them to be positive who were not there. So I think that it is very important to say that this continues to be a pandemic. I got involved with doing the work around HIV and AIDS uh, many, many years ago now, primarily because it was so terribly stigmatized. I'm born and raised in a classical Pentecostal family. And because of that, I was already experiencing some degree of exile because I am a same gender loving woman. And because I had the audacity to believe that God called me to be a pastor and a leader of leaders, all of which was anathema, all of which was problematic uh, in my family. And then also a uh, call to people who are the most exiled, the most dispossessed uh, in our communities. And that would of course include uh, people who are homeless, people who are housing insecure, food insecure, inner city, uh, the, the trans community and the gender non-conforming community and people on the edges, whatever the edges were reasonably distant from the center. And during that time, HIV and AIDS was definitely the disease thought to be uh, by conservatives, the wrath of God and the anger of God, uh, God who did not aim well <laughs> because it was an equal opportunity virus. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that was what motivated me. The other thing is that we were losing friends. We were losing friends and we were losing family members and we were losing people that were close to and dear to our hearts uh, just by the truckload before we ever really knew how this disease was being transmitted from one person to another. And so I felt as along with the City of Refuge, those of us that were involved in our nonprofit that ended up being the first of its kind to, do, to provide housing for people living with HIV, the first of its kind to provide housing for women, the second house who are living with HIV and it goes on and on and on. So it was the blessing of my exile that pulled me or called me to concern myself with the exile that was the reality for so many other people. Thank you so much. Just to follow up real quick, was there a particular moment or event that you remembered that really sort of made this click for you, that this was something that was really kind of happening? Yes, um, I can tell you ex almost exactly what happened to me. Um, I was um, grieving 
having multiple loss syndrome is probably what it would be because so many of my friends and loved ones and beloved were dying or dead. It happened very quickly. And I had like almost 170 some um, obituaries that either services that I had preached for uh, or sung for or something. It was just a mounting number of people. And it's that multiple loss syndrome that gave me the, the blues, can I say it that way? And I remember sitting down in my house, sort of in a dark space. I turned all the lights off and I started playing Donny Hathaway music. And you'd have to know that uh, it was one of those, just one of those songs. It was, um, a giving up is hard to do when you really love someone. So I was listening to Donny Hathaway sing and I was uh, drinking bourbon straight, like half a glass of bourbon. And uh, just totally dismayed, listening to the news, sort of in the way that women are dismayed, listening to some of the conversations at, at, this, at the um, high court, you know, uh, that feeling where you, the bottom falls out of your belly because you know how people will be disaffected. And in that moment, I heard what I believe then and believe now to be the voice of God. And that was not only why am I asking God to do something about it, but the question is why am I not doing something about it? What is the something that I can do? And that was in many ways the beginning of my becoming deeply involved in AIDS and AIDS related ministry. I gave my whole body to it, my whole life to it because something had to be done. Sorrow was not enough. And that moved me through years and years of work in San Francisco and then of course in California and eventually on the AIDS council under the leadership of President Obama. Uh, there's just so many things that happened from that time on. But it was a glass of bourbon and a complete pity party with the blues all at the same time where I had a great spiritual moment that said that I needed to become involved and engaged in doing, and that led to so many different doors opening, even the minority AIDS initiatives that myself and my colleagues went down there to Helene Gale's office and acted up something fierceable. But we got a lot of money poured into communities of color who were also at that point dispossessed as it related to funds to do the work in and among people. And the, the greatest pushback that I got was from religion, as is the case now in so many ways um, as it relates to justice issues that that is continues to be in many cases the pushback. So that's sort of where my, my aha moment came. <laughs> Thank bourbon, you. don't forget it was bourbon, bourbon related aha. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Steve, how did you start work with AIDS well, activism? I, I got involved because I got sick 40 years ago in 1982 and I was diagnosed with GRID, what they were calling AIDS back then, gay related immunodeficiency, which of course it was not just gay related, but um, that's what they thought at the time. And I was very sick through 82 and 83 with uh, hepatitis C and V, pneumonia, mononucleosis, herpes, shingles, a variety of fungal infections until finally I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma and capacy sarcoma in April of 84 and given eight months to live. And uh, my pastor, I was serving on the staff of MCC in the Valley in North Hollywood, Metropolitan Community Church. And uh, my pastor, Reverend Ken Martin, uh, invited me to preach the Easter sermon two weeks after I was diagnosed as terminal. And uh, I, I said, you mean Good Friday, don't you? I'm, I'm dying. And he said, no, you need to preach Easter. And it was one of the best gifts anybody could have given me to really look at what it meant to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a person facing a most certain death. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I preached that Easter Sunday that if God is greater than the death of Jesus on the cross, then God is greater than AIDS. And, uh, and I, I preached that, uh, uh, you know, if, 
uh, although they told me the worst thing they could possibly tell me, I discovered that I could still be fully alive, even in the face of death. I could still dance, I could still laugh, I could still sing. And um, I set out, my do I had a very wise doctor who told me that, uh, uh, you know, one in a million may survive this. And why not believe you're going to be that one in a million and act accordingly and build your own health program? Because there was nothing written about AIDS back then, uh, not, no health wellness plans or anything. So um, uh, I was invited to preach to um, write articles uh, in the monthly uh, magazine of the Metropolitan Community Church's Journey magazine, uh, Paula Shaneweather. Uh, the editor invited me and and I decided it was important as the first member of the clergy in the, all of metropolitan community churches to be diagnosed with AIDS to put a human face on it and uh, and and share my experience and my strength and my hope in the face of all the hopelessness and so that's how I got involved <laughs> and a lot of pot was involved in that too marijuana <laughs> May I follow up on, on that just just for you know be, because I teach students who are you know 18 to 22 years old and I try to paint a picture for them of what life was like you know before the AIDS crisis happens and we knew about it but can you give us a sense for what it was like to be a queer person diagnosed that early in the pandemic I mean you know like, yeah. like how would you explain it to someone who's maybe 20 or 21 years old and doesn't quite well, it, it was, a, uh, we didn't know how AIDS was transmitted. We didn't know how we caught it. And, and even after we knew that it was uh, sexually transmitted and, and through blood products, uh, it, uh, it, there was still so much fear about it. Uh, there, it took me three months to find a deacon who was willing to come to my house and bring me communion when I was housebound with AIDS in 82 and 83. Uh, and I felt abandoned, uh, really badly abandoned. And if it hadn't been for a group of lesbian women uh, uh, who uh, were part of the De Calores MCC, the women's MCC at the time in Los Angeles, I, I don't know what I would have done because they kept me company. They taught me about the rhythms of the body and about how to be sick and how to ride the waves of that. They brought me my groceries. Uh, they held my hand through the worst of it. Uh, and, you know, so thank God for the lesbian women in my life. Uh, at this time. There was so much. Fear. Thank you, Steve. Um, Ted, how did you become involved with AIDS work? Um, I was a pa first, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, event too long, way too long. <laughs> Um, I'm Canon Ted Karp, and I've recently retired from full-time church service, but I keep working in spite of myself. Uh, I was called to be the priest of a, a failed parish in Dallas in the early 80s. Dallas, the city of economic boom and bust, uh, and by 85, it was busted completely. As a parish priest, I was called to restart this congregation. And early on, uh, I moved it from 27 souls remaining to 180. But I was also proximate to the, to the Dallas gay community. MCC was six blocks away and quote, the gay neighborhood of Dallas was about 12 blocks away. So it was a natural phenomenon to experience the community, gay and lesbian, trans and bi, everybody was there. My first encounter with AIDS though happened unknowingly with me uh, in Fort Worth, Texas uh, in 1982 and 83. But we didn't have a name and nobody knew even the orientation of our parishioners who suddenly vanished and subsequently died. So it, it was there, but in February of 1984, this guy walks up to my door on a winter morning. My name is Jerome, and his, he was covered with Kaposi sarcoma. He was about 33 years of age, 
He was suffering with pneumonia and to active tuberculosis. Um, pale and gaunt, he looked decades older than what he was. And he only had one question, may I die in your church? With that then, he explained that he'd been to a number of other congregations and clergy of many denominations, and it was always the same story. Upon seeing him, they would ask him to leave. And he said, I became too sick to care, but I heard that this is a reasonably open congregation. So I'm going to repeat my question, may I die in your church? Until that moment, it never dawned on me that anyone would actually ask someone to leave a church. I thought, isn't that why we're here? So instantly, I said, well, of course, but first tell me what we can do to help. And that is where the change actually began. Um, he sobbed for a while. We got a, I got a list of what he needed and where he needed to be and what needed to happen in his life. Uh, with that, I put together a care network within the congregation of a few folks willing to stand up and be present, knowing that this specter was haunting the gay community, but nobody willing to say what it was or how it worked, uh, just that it was an awareness that we were there. And many of the men in my congregation were in their late 20s and early 30s, with a couple of outliers in their late 40s and early 50s. Um, with that there, and with that, he began to believe in life. And through that, I started learning what the healthcare system was and wasn't, and what it would and wouldn't do. And, and you know, a little piece of history in that, this was the time that the DRGs came into play in hospital systems, driven in large part by Medicare and Medicaid. It was a program to establish that there were set ways to be hospitalized. There were time limits on processes and procedures. And it still is the haunting specter for anybody approaching healthcare in this country of, will I get thrown out of the hospital? I'm not sick enough to stay, even if I can't take care of myself. So with that, I learned a whole lot of things and also discovered a lot of middle-class gay men who had no idea how the public health system or the public hospital system worked, but also had run out of benefits from either being fired from their employ because they were sick or simply not knowing how to access the services that were there. But most private hospitals in Dallas then did not want to treat anybody with AIDS if they knew about it. So with that, we began a journey. Uh, within months, however, uh, uproar began in the congregation. And that finally brought me to being um, functionally inhibited from ministry by the lack of pay, but actually uh, stopped in my tracks when the nightmare happened in September, uh, where I held church and nobody came. And that was, that was kind of the statement. And we had three people at the altar and I said, well, wherever two or three are gathered, I guess this is it. Uh, there were 20 cars out in the parking lot, uh, but they were afraid to come in mostly with gay people who were afraid of being discriminated against because the rumor had hit the community that this church was, was going to be boycotted and shut down. Well, it didn't happen. We rang the bells and that day we ended up serving communion to a dozen folks. And I made a statement then and I kept it ever since. These doors will never be closed to anybody. Um, day after <laughs> of that experience, the bishop showed up and asked me to resign. And I said, being a canon lawyer, I immediately responded by saying, well, actually I can't because you have to resign to a vestry, my vestry quit last week. So I'm gonna stay for a hundred days and if we can't turn it around, then we'll, we'll do other things. I didn't know then as well that the economic interests were playing hard on this story. The, the diocese had been offered a great deal of money to tear down the church so a strip mall could be built. 
that was immediately adjacent to a black community that was also scheduled to be leveled. Uh, and the net effect of that was I didn't leave, we didn't leave, they didn't leave. And those communities today are still intact. But that's how economics plays out in these stories all too often. Within 100 days, we had about 100 folks back in church, uh, new members. And I made one statement always to anybody interested. They say, we really want to join. And I said, you can't. <laughs> and you may remember in those days, American Express had a, had a slogan, which I used. Membership has its privileges. I said membership has its responsibilities. And with that, if you've got trouble with any minority of any kind, you probably won't be at home in this place. And that was good. It was outrageous, irregular, and whatnot. But uh, we began, and I learned something at the time of Jerome's death, some 10 months later. Uh, his closest friend was the vice president of a major national corporation. And he stopped me at graveside and said, you know, Jerome's life changed everything. You welcomed him. He found a place to be himself where he had respect and purpose for living. He found people who cared about him beyond me. And then everything changed. He started to live again. And in so doing, rediscovered his faith, and he's found his life. To the answer to the question, may I die in your church, that I had to answer 150 more times in the next four years. And from that, I crashed at the end uh, with absolute burnout uh, as we rebuilt the care systems in Dallas and organized a way of moving forward for all people, modeled on what was happening in San Francisco with the case management system. But the church continually has been one of the real stumbling blocks in making AIDS work possible in many, many communities. And I regret to say, even with 30,000 transmissions today, it still continues. Just to build on that point, Ted, thank you so much. I have so many questions for all of you and you should feel free to, to jump in and, and talk with one another as well. Um, but I was curious, you know, um, as Bishop Flunder mentioned, in, in these early years throughout the 80s and 90s, and, and sometimes and now, AIDS is, is often thought of as, as the wrath of God, as a punishment. I mean, the Christian right in particular was so successful in, in taking ownership of that rhetoric in, in such terrible ways. And, and, and yet, you know, we're here, you're here, not, not only as, as people within religious communities, but as Christians doing this work at a moment when, you know, AIDS and religion were, were often thought to be antithetical to one another. Um, how is it important for your work that you were a Christian person, that you were a Christian activist working within AIDS work? I go farther to say gay Christian people. <laughs> <laughs> we were on top of all of that. It brings up a lot of understandings for me of Jesus um, that are far and apart from what we have created uh, Jesus to be, if you understand. And, and I, 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 there's a juxtaposition for me. I remember very well uh, when the Westboro Baptist Church came to San Francisco Oh, yeah. uh, to to uh, attack directly the LGBT community. They told all of us that they were coming. And they specifically said to me and us, because we were a premier church and uh, primarily African-American with a robust number of trans people, trans identified people as part of our congregation. So they said they were coming to uh, City of Refuge and they were coming, you know, ready, loaded, locked and loaded, essentially to uh, create a big demonstration and they had gotten the, the uh, other, what they believed to be fundamentalist uh, Christians to be with them. And so I sent word back to them. I said, oh, uh, certainly, and we're looking for you to come. And so they got a little stymied. They said, well, what does that mean? I said, but just tell them that we, are, we will be completely prepared 
to have you come and visit with us. Bring everything that you have, everything. Bring the best, bring the, bring the news, bring your people, bring your drums, bring your trumpets, whatever you wanna bring, we will be ready. I said, I'm sending now for busloads of trans people from Los Angeles and uh, from San Francisco and from Oakland and everywhere we can come and we will be ready for you. We never heard back from you. We never heard back from you. Okay? We never great. heard back from them again. Um, and I said to my folks, I said, you know, and, and I'll use a scripture. God never gave us a spirit of fear, a spirit of power, the spirit of love, and sound mind. Mm -hmm. And throughout my experience uh, being in an, an extremely, uh, how can I say, an extremely um, narrow concept of God and, and Jesus, always focused on the resurrection and the coming of Christ. All we thought Jesus is coming on Friday all the time. <laughs> Always, always focusing on the angry God, that if you don't do this and you don't do this, God will get your butt. You know, that's the, that was the way we were raised. Then all of a sudden, we realized that, that what we needed to be is people who could gather a certain militancy about our right to exist, about our right to sit in God's lap, just like everyone else that feels like they know God up close and personal about our ability to also fight for ourselves. And it became another social justice ministry. It became, it became the March on Washington and it became crossing the Pettus Bridge. But this time for people who were LGBT, people who were uh, dispossessed by their families because they were gay, people who were thrown into separate pots. And it also was a testimony this is what I really, really want so much to say. A testimony to the many people who abdicated their, their realities, their otherness in order to fit in. To what my brother said a minute ago, you, you can know that you have Carposis, but it, has, it isn't showing yet. So perhaps you wear a high collar shirt or you, you, know, you put some makeup on the, the lesions in some way and try to show up as long as you can until somebody can look at you and tell. And where that worked, or where that showed up a lot for my folks was you'd stay around until you couldn't hide any longer. You know, if you, if you were involved in a same gender relationship, you know, it's don't ask, don't tell. You know, if that, if that relationship was with your past, because I got stories, you better believe me, I got stories, you hear me? Okay, wherever that relationship was, some people decided to get married into a heterosexual relationship in hopes that the, that the curse would not be upon them, either because they thought that, that God would heal them through it, or they thought that they would be better received. This is also, I buried a couple. The, the, the wife died first, and then the husband because they believe that if they got married in a heterosexual relationship, that God would heal him and that she would not be subject to them. I, there's, more, there's so much that I could say, but it was about not just doing the work. It was about speaking to people about all of the things about life and living that have been diminished as it relates to your personhood. And let me say that in the triangular relationship that I have had with these issues of being a woman, a woman clergy person, of being a person of African descent and what that reality has been for us. And then to add to that a stigma that's associated with a communicable disease and have that essentially be the church's mantra of the anger of God. The same people that use the Bible to support slavery, the same people that use the Bible to diminish women were the same people that use the Bible to diminish gay people are the same people that use the Bible to take a woman's right to choose yes. the same yes. people that I mean I could go on and on there's always yes. something in there to use to beat the hell out of somebody so that's the important piece the new lenses of the theology that is a welcome what my brother said a minute ago our job has never been to choose who can come to God's table. It has never been our job. Our only job 
is to provide more tables and more chairs, yeah. push back the tent pegs and make room for as many people as desire to come to the table of God. That is our only task. Yeah. That's our only job. So anyway, I'm on a Pentecostal ramp. So we got that. We got the spirit, sister. <laughs> got the spirit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Steve, do you want to go? <laughs> well, you know, I uh, in the answer to the question about the, you know, is it God's punishment? I, I certainly went through that personally. And then I and I was prepared and and I came out in a different place. I, I felt like God was doing this to me. And why me? And then somebody said to me, why not you? Uh, and, and then um, I suddenly realized that uh, my model for ministry had always been Emmanuel, God with us. And that's not God over us or God surrounding us or God rescuing us, but God with us. And so we were called, I am called, we are called, not to rescue people from their situations, but to be with them. And that was where ministry hit the road, to being with people as they got sick, being with people as they had hospital trays left outside their, their hospital room, you know, the luncheon trays, being with people as they died. I found I had a great gift, having been on my deathbed for quite some time, I had a gift for helping people heal into their deaths. And, and that was about accompanying them, being with them as, as a vehicle of God's love and hope, of bringing hope where there was hopelessness. It's, it, I found that it is indeed possible to have hope even on your deathbed, you know? And, and uh, I just, I kept, I mean, the, I don't know if you could all see the little picture that I have when my camera's off, but it's a, a t-shirt said hope with a red ribbon for the O. And I saw that as my calling to bring hope, even in the face of death, to bring hope for healing, whether you heal into life or death. Um, I, 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 I preached about Peter Pan and how important it is to believe in fairies because so many good fairies were dying and people it, we were called to believe in ourselves the way that the audiences believe in Tinkerbell when she's dying you know and and clap your hands if you believe in fairies and and you know believe in yourself enough to do the work of healing and it's yeah. hard work but we were called to be with people in their suffering and in their dying. Uh, and, and that to me is the, is the model for ministry, not, you know, God's punishment is upon you and you must be rescued from this. No, 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 no. no. God with us. God with us. I think the reality, thanks, Steve, because I still love you in that shirt. <laughs> I, <cannot remember. laughs> yeah. I think you know what all of us have in common is yeah fear is rampant it's still rampant in our culture for lots of reasons which the bishop has already expressed rather eloquently yes what i learned though in the face of AIDS and particularly infectious diseases of all kinds Reason and statistics have never convinced anybody. Yeah. If they had, slavery couldn't have happened. And we can go through a whole list of things. Women would not have been left out and forgotten in a franchise. And we wouldn't have had a court that made a decision like it did 48 hours ago. Those are the things that are true. But there is a tendency in humans, and I think as clergy, as Christians, people called into this relationship with Emmanuel, yes. that we are called into a leadership which is collaborative. We are called into leadership which is cooperative with one another and holding people in their fearfulness to a place like a child in a way where they no longer need to be afraid as we go through all the scary things that can happen. I said the second aspect of that is faith. 
And I think it's, it's, it's not part of a sociological formula, but it's crucial. All of us do this because we were called to it. And it wasn't through our great merits because I think at the point any of us were called, we were not meritorious about much of anything. <laughs> but we knew with inside that that call would mean we would stay in the struggle over the long haul for freedom, justice, dignity, and respect. And I really have to say, is there any other reason? <laughs> That's quite adequate right there. And yeah. finally, the realization that God's time is not my time. Right. And boy, that, that you know, it, it took reading the Hebrew scriptures over and over and over again to realize that what felt immediate was going to be a long-term journey and following the development of the Christian community, what they thought was going to happen at any of a thousand different points in that first millennium didn't. In fact, it was despoiled repeatedly and out of the dregs, they had to kind of pull it together. And Yvette touched on it so beautifully when she said, you face the fear because love casts out fear. Out all fear. And perfect love casts out fear yes. forever. Yes. And that's a mantra I think we've all shared and had to preach about from yes. constantly, not because of AIDS, but because the challenge of life makes us do that. You know, the year before I moved to Los Angeles and started getting sick with AIDS with GRID, I heard William Sloan Coffin speak. Yes. And he talked about, we have a, you know, fear is a natural, fear is just a given. Everybody is, experiences fear. And especially where something like AIDS is concerned, there's so much fear. There was so much fear and there still is. We have a choice about what to do with the fear. We can be scared to death or we can be scared to life. Yeah. And that yeah. is, you know, we can be, we can allow the fear to paralyze us, to make us go home and shut the windows and wait to shut the drapes and wait to die. Or we can be scared into doing everything we need to do to be fully alive, even in the face of AIDS and death. Absolutely. Absolutely, by the way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Just to follow up on this and to start to segue into some Q&A, and please, if you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. We have a few so far. And, and, and one that I wanted to, to get to builds upon what, what you've all been saying. Um, and it has to do with questions about not just fear, but also grief and the ongoingness of the AIDS mm -hmm. crisis. It continues today. Now we also have COVID. I think Yesterday, we passed 1 million deaths in the United States alone to, to COVID. Um, but, but thinking about grief, and, and not just grief, but grief over time, um, durational grief, what kinds of resources, whether spiritual, secular, community, all of the above, what kinds of resources did you all draw upon, have you drawn upon, do you continue to draw upon in 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 this work? I can tell you about my experience. Um, and, it, and it isn't complicated, by the way. Uh, I am healed in the, in the presence of community. Because there, there's certain grief that is wordless. There's just, um, there are no words to really describe it. And, and I think if you've had multiple grief, multiple loss syndrome, you may know what it is that I'm saying, but there is something very powerful about being in the company of, in the presence of people who, where I am known and where I am loved and cared for. Yes. It can even be wordless. Nobody has to really say anything, just be in the company of people, but it gets even better when we have some chicken, you know, some greens and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> some cornbread <laughs> when we share stories. Uh, I would venture to say that the, the ticket to get into that reality is transparency. Yes. Which is hard for religious leaders. We are not um, taught to be transparent. I remember 
in, in my years in seminary, in all of my degrees, there was always somebody who believed and said that you don't bleed on the people. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's always somebody who thought that, which is so counterculture to me as an African-American woman, I have to tell you this. We don't bleed on the people, don't bleed on the people. And I'll, I'll say this to you this way. I, I lost my mother to liver and, excuse me, to, to lung cancer with some, that was the ultimate way in which she died, was lung cancer. And um, I saw her, the pictures of her lungs uh, before she passed away, which left a, a stain, an emotional, in, in my heart, in, in my mind. And, and um, I went before my congregation with it in my mind that you don't bleed on the people, if you understand. But I wanted to share with them what had been the experience. And while I was telling them about my mother, uh, and the diagnosis, both prognosis and the diagnosis for my mother. In the middle of me talking about it, I had an emotion, emotional break, a complete break. I was standing behind the pulpit. The next thing I knew, I was in a hovel uh, down on the floor behind the pulpit. Then I was upset and aggravated with myself because I'd had this break emotionally. I'm the pastor and uh, the bishop of several churches. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this can't be happening, but it happened. Long story short, when I opened my eyes, I came to myself, the pulpit was filled with people. They came from on both sides. They came all the way up and then they sat down on the floor with me. And there we all were sitting down on the floor as many as could get up there throughout the congregation. They came all the way from the back. They came as close as they could. Nothing was being said. They were just there. And for the few minutes that it took for me to get it together, they gave me those minutes by touching me either directly or touching the person behind the person who was touching me. We wept, we grieved together. I got up off the floor, got back behind the pulpit and preached, and picked up the service and went on and went from there. We do, that's what we do. Hallelujah. It's healing, Hallelujah. and that's the, they, yes. the people healed me. Amen. Because, and I wanted to go back and teach as I have many times at the seminaries, and I've said, stop telling people not to bleed in front of people. Jesus bled. Uh -huh. Stop telling people not to bleed because you're asking us to wall up a part of us that is so much a part of our humanity. That's where my healing, it came from the touch of the people that love him, without question. Beautiful. I, th I think Yvette put it wizardly on the piece that we often forget in doing this work and have always done this work is it's a community effort. Mm -hmm. I think wherever we experience burnout, it's because we tried to do it all ourselves. And I think burnout is God's gift to remind us that we are not the whole story of the story. And that, in fact, the laity, the leadership across our multiple communities carry a lot of that burden as much as we do day by day. We also discovered in grief, it's necessary. It's the only way we can recognize that loss really happens. And when somebody says, I know grieve, I just shake my head and I said, let me pray for you. <laughs> because, <laughs> huh, grieving is what we live with. And if we look around us on these anniversaries of a million dead from COVID and several millions more dead from HIV over these 40 years, uh, I think no day said it better for me than standing in a graveyard on a Saturday morning in Johannesburg, South Africa. Hmm. And for the next 13 hours, we did 50 different funerals back to back every 10 or 15 minutes. Oh my it God. was the only way to get through it. Yeah. And in every case, I always watched the cycle of the, the agony and the chanting and the keening in the face of loss. Yeah. And then suddenly somebody would start a hymn and the whole graveyard started singing. Thousands of voices singing together. And that's what made that grief bearable. That's what made the grief 
possible. And when those folks went home, was the loss real? Of course it was. It didn't end at graveside. And in our curious American economy of feeling, we think it should be over in three days. Hell, I don't know anything that's over in three days, including the resurrection. It's just not over. So we are called upon, I think, to live in the face of that. Steve. Well, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Bishop Flunder's beautiful comments about this and yours, Ted, just the, the, the quilt came to my head. Yes. And yeah. the, the communal experience of grief that we experienced walking on the quilt or observing the quilt on the walls of wherever we were. Uh, but when it was it, spread it, out on the mall. Just for folks who might not know the AIDS quilt, can you just say just a little bit about the AIDS quilt? The AIDS quilt, quilt yeah. was a way for people to channel their grief by making a quilt for their beloved who had died. And they were at the names project, put them all together and spread them out on the mall in Washington. I think it was 1993. Or 94 and and it went all the way from the washington monument to the capitol that was 96 when it, it was 96 was it was huge it was huge but walking onto that quilt one could not help but experience deep grief if if you were in touch at all with with the communal grief and with your own grief about what had happened and you know now you know i've always felt like grief is cumulative uh, when we grieve the person who died yesterday, we're grieving all the people who've died in our lives. Yes. And, yes. and that, that came to life for me when a dear friend of mine who had AIDS and lived and then died of COVID in the first surge of people getting sick and dying with COVID, when he died of COVID with uh, the same complications that I had uh, with AIDS, um, you know, I not only grieved him, but I was aware of this profound grief of, of 40 years ago, you know, when we started losing people one by one by one, and the death march started speeding up through the 80s and the 90s until 96. And then the death march continues in Africa and, and, and India and, and, and all kinds of places all over the world. Here in America, people still die of AIDS uh, and people die of COVID and the grief is palpable and the only way out is through. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I think the, I think the, the working re reality is that in, for all of us, AIDS has been part of our lives since the day we heard the word. There has never been a time for any one of us that I know of where we have not carried people living with HIV. It's different than it was at the beginning. There's now treatment in, in the privileged world for same. Uh, but the fact remains is wherever we've been, we carry endless numbers of people living and dead. And for me, it restored my belief in the ancestors. It restored my belief in the communion of the saints yeah. because that's the story. Uh -huh. And that we've always coexisted, the living and the dead and the dying and the birthing. We have lived in those circles all of our lives. And all, all that AIDS did in one respect was cause us to see the reality of that invisible quilt that we carry, that we live with, that we contribute to each day of our lives. Beautifully said. Thank you. Let me try to put two questions out here that are kind of related. Um, one is how do we make AIDS part of ongoing ministry work? Not just something that comes up on World AIDS Day, but that is really active throughout the year. Um, and then perhaps relatedly to sort of keeping that, 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 that thread going, what have you all learned from your work with AIDS organizing and AIDS spirituality that might help us strategize in 
what are going to be some real upcoming str struggles around issues like abortion and reproductive justice in the coming days and weeks and years ahead? I think we have a responsibility to destigmatize faith. Mm. Um, when faith becomes an excuse to uh, afford stigma in the lives of people, then we are using God as a bludgeon. I want to say that again. We already know who we hate. What we try to do is to get God to hate him too. That, that's basically the, the basic understanding. Um, and I'll, I'll be very transparent about this too. One of my members, key members of my church that died from complications due to uh, HIV and AIDS. I got a call from the coroner's office uh, to come to his house. Um, to make a long story short, he came from a Jehovah's Witness family. When I got to the house, his brother and his sister were there. I came in the house, the door was ajar. I came in the house quietly and carefully. And then of course, spoke to his siblings and looked around and I was saying, so where's Terry? Because I didn't see his body. Went to the bedroom first and I didn't see him. He, the brother pointed to a pile of, of clothes that had come from a hamper mm. on the floor. Uh, in the door of the bathroom. And he said to me, he said, he's under those clothes. Mm. To which I said, he's under the clothes? That was my response to him. And he said, yes. So I said, so that's where you left him or where you found him? He said, no, we, we found him in the doorway. We put the clothes on and covered him up that way. Uh -huh. Make a long story short, after that, the, the coroner's office uh, came by and I understood the circumstance, the situation. When the coroner's office came by, he had been on the floor long enough to be rigored. And he had to be lifted onto the gurney to be taken downstairs. And so I said to the brother, I motioned to him and said, well, could you help us? He said, I can't touch him. So what do you mean you can't touch him? I can't touch him. He couldn't touch him because he did, doesn't touch the dead and he couldn't touch him because Terry had left the faith as a Jehovah's Witness. And so I'm 5'2", on my, and I'm somewhere between 5'2 and 5'3". <laughs> but on my tallest day, the most I'm gonna be is 5'3". He was rigored, he was 6'2". And the coroner who came by himself because he knew that Terry had family at the house. He and I had to lift him onto the gurney and then because he had to go into the elevator this way in order to get on the elevator, we had to unrigor him. If you've ever had that experience, it's quite something. I had to get on top of his body, sit down on his chest while the coroner was pushing down on his legs. And we did this seesaw until the body began to lower itself down on the gurney, then tie him up very tightly to get him and the brother went as far away as he possibly could in the room. Why am I lifting this up? Because I have just had it up to here with multiple years of what I call bad religion, toxic religion, that somehow or other suggests that it, it exists in honor of and in reverence to the brown Palestinian Jew who is Jesus, Yeshua. That, that person who embodied in so many ways the presence, the will, and the wind, and the voice, and the way of God. Mm -hmm. I am just amazed at the way in which we decide who we will hate. And this is our history, whether it began with the, the native people of this land, and it, it went to the idea, of, and I have to say, can I say something dangerous today? I have to say <laughs> that oftentimes, the, the Bible as we read it, when we read it literally, we can find a way to hate whomever we want to hate. There is always a group of people, always, always beloved, a group of people, a situation that we can assign to our religion, some sort of prioritized position that can make one greater than the other. I will say again, slavery, the Bible was on the side of the slaveholders. There was a lot of scripture in there that talked to slaves and told them to obey their masters as they do the Lord. How, how is it then that we can ever be delivered from this if we use the text, if we use our existing prejudices, if we use 
our, the teachings of people who are also sick with hatred and division and racism and sexism and homophobia, transphobia, how do we get free? And I will say it this way and, and yield to my brothers. We have absolutely got to contend for new religion, good religion, undefined, to care for the widows and orphans, to live unspotted from the systems of the world. Who cares? At the end of the day, what the Supreme Court do? If, if enough people who know God and who know that they are known by God and that the God of their understanding is the God that has a heart for all humanity and nature and the planet and, and, and. We won't have to die to go to heaven. We can do what Jesus said when you pray. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How about that? On earth yeah. as it is in heaven. That's where my heart is theologically. Our theme for TFAM, for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, ask the question, have you got good religion? Not have you got religion, mm -hmm. but have you got good, life-saving, affirming religion? That is the question that I am asking Yvette and I'm asking everyone that I come in contact with. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, sister, you preached it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so why don't we end with one last question um, somebody else besides me, by the way. Go ahead. From the audience, <laughs> um, from Dana Robert, who is talking about how this has brought back so much. Um, and and uh, Dana mentioned a conversation with a close friend who talked about how he thought that the gay community has a special calling through HIV AIDS, through the crisis to serve others um, because it's been so well educated and proactive in this fight. And she asks, what do you think as theologians of this idea of a special calling? Well, I think part of, part of what it means to be in any minority is to be aware of how many structures there are that would inhibit freedom and take away justice and deny opportunity. I mean, that so... I'm not going to plea for special calling as much as to say, were we sensitized? To some extent, yes, by what happened and who we were when it all was unfolding. But I would continue to say people who see themselves in any kind of a majority need to look again. Because that status of minority, however we want to define it, is coexistent for every single one of us. No one is immune from that. And, you know, the large minority that I point to is those who simply dwell in fear and no other opportunity is allowed to arise. So while there is a calling to which we were all sensitized and responded, I'm not sure it was as much special as God opened our ears and hearts in the right way to receive what was challenging us in that moment and the subsequent moments. Further to that, I think the larger, the larger issue is that I could have never imagined at the beginning to be here 40 years later, I remember telling people, this will be over in five years, this will be over in 10, 15, 20, and here we still are. Uh, we're still doing the same work, but more awake perhaps, or more aware of all the, of the dimensions. My model is I always look to Jesus for that, who reached into his own bag of immunities and realized he didn't have any. He was not immune from any of the, tra the trauma and the tragedy of his age. And by merit of his calling, none of us were either. Mm. And we were deceiving ourselves if we thought we possessed some special immunity. We don't. Mm. And I think following and being a person of faith requires, as it were, requires of us to surrender our illusion that we are immune. Nobody's immune. 
Thank no. you for that, Ted. Steve, please, um, we'll give you the last word here before we close out. My God, the responsibility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Make it good, Steve. <laughs> well, first of all, what an honor to have been in conversation with, with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I mean, oh my God, Absolutely. so special. Um, you know, I think it's really, imp you know, I want to say a, a word on behalf of, of the special calling that, that LGBTQ people have. You know, I think we're called to be fabulous. And, yes. you know, absolutely, and we are <laughs> absolutely fabulous and fantastic and out and proud and loud and and we can lead the way in understanding God with us Emmanuel, yes. the the Jesus who gives us life in the face of death who gives us uh, grace in the face of all the hopelessness you know and uh, I just think it's really, really important, you know, that straying outside of Christianity for a moment, there's a wonderful Native American saying that the quality of life is not measured by the length of life, right. but by the fullness with which we enter into each present moment. And God knows I learned that the hard way when I was so sick with AIDS and, and thought I was going to die shortly. Um, None of us have any guarantees about being here tomorrow. That's right. Any, all of us, any, all, all of us, the only thing we have is right now. And so right now, I choose to feel fabulous. I choose to feel gay. I choose to celebrate my lesbian, trans, bisexual, queer, intersex, and allied people. Uh, for all the fabulous ways that they are. And um, I still believe in fairies. <laughs> you know? So right now, I believe in love. And isn't that yes. what it's all about? The answer to fear, the answer to hatred. <laughs> Hallelujah. About love. Hallelujah. Thank you all so much. This has just been privilege and a joy to have this conversation with you all. Mark, I'll turn it back over yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, Yvette, Ted, and Steve for this impassioned and insightful um, conversation for, for the work you've all done for the last 40 years. And many of you on this call also have walked this journey and walked this path along with them, alongside them, and in different areas. Um, everyone is to be commended for just the kind of witness and ministry and um, examples and modeling of love and justice, which have happened through AIDS ministry and AIDS activism and AIDS advocacy. Um, all of you, within a few days, you're gonna receive an email with a link to a recording of tonight's program that you can share with friends and colleagues. If you are interested in more opportunities to explore the history of queer religious movements, remember to check out the LGBTQ RAN website and particularly our events page. There you find announcements of future online programs as well as the recordings of our past presentations. Finally, in closing, I remind you that LGBTQ RAN is the first and foremost source of information on queer religious history. We are a very, very small operation that is funded through the generosity of friends like you. So if you would like to see more programs like tonight's, and if you share our commitment to ensure that future generations will hear our voices and stories, please help make this happen with your gift. Finally, I remind you that if you would like to offer personal greetings or comments to one of the presenters, stay here and you will be invited into the Zoom room with them. I close with one more thank you to our awesome presenters and our most gracious audience. Good night to all. <laughs>